my top four dividend stocks in the communication sector. Let's jump right in. Starting off with number one, we got the Walt Disney Company, which is one of the biggest media companies out there to go alongside with their parks business. So Disney has four reporting segments, of course, one of them being their Disney parks. That includes the Disney World Park, the Disney Cruise Lines, and a whole bunch of other resorts. They also have their studio entertainment side, which includes Pixar, Marvel Studios, and Lucas Films, which are pretty much the cream of the crop when it comes to studios. And then their last two reporting segments are media networks and direct to consumer. Their media networks has ESPN, ABC, National Geographic, and their direct to consumer side includes ESPN Plus and of course Disney Plus, which is one of the top priorities at Disney right now. So we can take a look at these four reporting segments and how they contribute to the bottom and top line for Disney. And as we can see here, more than 70% of the revenue and of the bottom line comes from media networks and parks. But I do think that over time, their direct to consumer side, specifically Disney Plus, could go ahead and pass their studio entertainment business and be a big part of Disney's business moving forward. As of right now, they're just focused on improving and growing the subscriber base of Disney Plus, but I do think that down the line, Disney Plus and the direct-to-consumer side can move up to that number three spot and be a big time contributor to Disney's top and bottom line. So moving on to dividends for Walt Disney. But before I start, I do want to say that Disney has had a really good track record of paying a consistent dividend. But however, as we all know, in these times, they did cut their dividend because of the whole pandemic situation but they did used to have a really good dividend track record. And I also wanna point out that this drop that you see here in their dividends on the dividend chart is not really a drop in dividends, but this was a point where they switched their annual dividend payment to a semi-annual dividend payment starting in 2015. So they actually have had increased their dividend and paid it for 10 consecutive years. But of course, as of right now in 2020, they did suspend their dividend. So taking a look at Disney's earnings, their four upcoming quarters are projected to be pretty rough for Disney, and they're actually expected to do only 45 cents within those next four quarters. And since they don't pay a dividend, we don't really need to worry about the payout ratio. Now, as far as valuation, their five-year average PE is at about 18, and as far as buying prices for Walt Disney, actually, I wouldn't personally buy any Disney shares right now if you're going to open up a new position. The only reason I would buy shares now would be to average down on a position that you already have. And that's actually the situation that I'm currently in. But if you do want to open up a new position in Disney right now, I'd probably try to value Disney using their normalized earnings. Now, what I mean by that is, what is Disney's earnings before the pandemic? And what could Disney's earnings be once we're past the pandemic? And I think Disney's normalized earnings could be around $6.50. Now that is a little bit conservative, but I don't think that's too far off in my opinion. Now with $6.50 and a price to earnings of 18, we get around that 117, 118 price range for Disney. But honestly, you'd probably be looking for a good discount as well. So if I were to give a buying price for Disney right now to open up a new position, it would be at the low 100s or even in the high 90s. But keep in mind that the main risk is always going to be when will Disney get back to their normalized earnings? Will it be in 2022? 2023? I mean, nobody really knows, right? And that's why I wouldn't personally open up a new position in Disney if I don't already own the stock. But as far as my position in Disney, I do own a few shares. I did started buying before the pandemic at around the $140 price point, which honestly, looking back, was a little bit impatient on my part. But once the pandemic started to happen and Disney started to close their parks, I started just averaging down my position so I got to where I am right now, which is at around 120 per share. And that's pretty close to that 117, 118 range. So I'm not looking to buy any more shares, at least for the time being. And as far as Disney's earnings per share growth, they are projected to grow 0.75 for the next five years annually. And that percentage is really low due to the fact that for the next two or three years, Disney's earnings could be negative or they're going to be showing very little growth. 
So moving on on the list, we got the Dividend Hall of Famer in AT&T. Now AT&T has five operating segments, but only two of them really matter, which is their communication side and their Warner Media business. So their communication side is what you would expect. It's their wireless plans, their networks that they give to consumers and to businesses. And then the Warner Media side is their entertainment side that they acquired in mid 2018. So as far as AT&T moving forward, they're pretty much just trying to maintain minimal growth in their wireless services for businesses and consumers with the only small bright spot being 5G and the adoption of 5G, they could benefit from 5G by selling 5G compatible devices and equipment, but I really don't think that's gonna be a major growth spot for AT&T. Now a brighter spot for them would be HBO Max, which they did launch earlier this year in May 2020. This could be a very good platform for AT&T to go into the streaming space and since they are the owners of Warner Media and they can distribute Warner Media's content, it is a good plan in theory, but it's all going to come down if AT&T could execute on their streaming platform of HBO Max. And that's probably my only concern with that is if they're going to be able to execute like Disney and Disney Plus, Apple and Apple TV, or even Netflix. But I guess we'll have to wait and see. Now, as far as dividends, they've been paying and growing their dividend for 35 consecutive years. I will say, however, their growth rate is pretty minimal. It's just barely keeping up with inflation. I think it's good to have even with the low growth for the cash flow. So AT&T is currently paying out $2.08 per share. That gives them a yield at current prices of almost 7% which is significantly higher than their four year dividend yield average. And as far as their earnings moving forward, their next four quarters are projected to be pretty stable. There is a slight decrease in these next four quarters, but they are projected to do $3.16 for the next four quarters. And with their payout at $2.08, that gives them a payout ratio of 66%, which is not the greatest in the world, but since AT&T is already paying a massive dividend, I mean, they almost have a 7% yield that's still okay and it's relatively safe. Now, their five-year average PE is at the $15 mark, which I think is a little bit too high for AT&T. I feel like that five-year average PE should be a little bit lower, but as far as buying prices goes, I'd probably buy into AT&T at around the 10 to 11 forward PE, which would put it at the 31 34 price point. Now I do have a pretty big position in AT&T, at least for my portfolio, it's almost 3%. And my average cost is at 33. This was one of those stocks that I purchased when I first started investing and I made it into a really big position just for the dividend at the time. But I do own quite a bit of shares now and I think 3% is a little bit too high, at least for where I want it to be in my portfolio. So that's the reason why I'm probably not going to be buying any shares at the moment. As far as their earnings growth for the next five years, they are projected to grow at about 1.7% for the next five years, which is pretty normal, I think, for AT&T. Their numbers could be a little bit better depending on how 5G goes for them, but I think that's pretty accurate for AT&T. Moving on, we got the mini AT&T in Verizon, and Verizon is pretty much the same exact thing as AT&T, just minus the Warner Media business. But anyways, they do have their segments split into consumer and business. So as far as Verizon's dividend, they have been paying and growing their dividend for 13 consecutive years. And I do believe that in 12 years, Verizon will be part of the dividend aristocrats with over 25 years of consecutive dividend growth. Now, they're currently paying $2.46 per share. And at these prices, that gives you a yield about four and a half, which is pretty much in line with their four year average. Now, taking a look at the forecasted four quarters for Verizon, just like AT&T, they do have stable earnings for the next four quarters. And if you notice, they don't have that big of a hit compared to AT&T, they're not affected as much by the pandemic as AT&T. So they are projected to do $4.76 per share, and that gives them a 52% payout ratio. And I think that's a really good, comfortable payout ratio for them to continue to pay. So their five-year average PE is at 13, which I think is more appropriate for this type of company. And a good buying opportunity, I think, would be at the 10 to 11 forward PE, which is at the 48 to $52 price range. Now, as far as my position in Verizon, I do own a few shares at the $54 price point. Now, I did buy into this stock 
recently and I think I bought a little bit too early but I kind of just wanted to open up the position and get it over with. Now as far as their earnings growth for the next five years they are projected to grow at that same 2% for the next five years which I think is fine for Verizon. And last on the list we got the gaming developers at Activision Blizzard which is a pretty different play from AT&T and Verizon as this stock has a little bit more growth potential than those two companies. So here are the three reporting segments for Activision Blizzard. They got Activision which has their Call of Duty franchise. They got Blizzard Entertainment that has World of Warcraft and Overwatch. And lastly they got King which is the app developer that made Candy Crush and I think other variations or other versions of Candy Crush. Now to be honest I actually thought that the Activision side the Call of Duty side of Activision Blizzard would bring in most of the revenues for this stock but they're actually pretty well rounded. I mean Activision, Blizzard Entertainment and King all have pretty good revenue numbers and pretty good operating income for the three segments. So that was actually pretty surprising when I looked into this company. Now as far as their dividend, they have been paying and growing their dividend for 10 consecutive years and I do want to point out one thing here, they pay their dividend annually. So they only pay it once per year. I think it's in around May when they pay their dividend, but it's not like your traditional company that pays it every quarter. Nothing wrong with that, but I just wanted to bring it up. Now, as far as your dividend right now, they are paying 41 cents per share. And at current prices, that's a dividend yield of less than 1% at 0.5, which is pretty much in line with their four year dividend yield average. Now here we have the forecasted four quarters for Activision Blizzard's earnings. And as we can see, their biggest earnings by far and away is their fourth quarter of every year. That's during the holidays when they have everybody buying their newest Call of Duty and they have their majority of their earnings coming throughout that quarter. Now for the next four quarters, they are projected to do about $2.68 and with their dividends at 41 cents, that gives them a really low, really solid payout ratio of 15%. This is definitely a company that could grow their dividend into the future. Now their five year average PE is 32 on this stock. Now I will say the growth rate projected on Activision does grant them a price to earnings of over 30. But honestly, if I wanted to get into this stock, I'd probably look for a price to earnings of around 24, 25, maybe even 26, which would put it at the 64 to $69 price range. Now, as far as me owning this stock, I don't own a position in Activision Blizzard. I'm not too sure if I would ever own this stock, to be honest. But on the other hand, I do think it could be a nice addition to my portfolio, at least for this sector. That includes AT&T and Verizon, which are pretty much slow and steady companies. This stock could go ahead and provide some growth for that sector in my portfolio. And speaking about growth, they are projected to do over 22% in earnings per share growth for the next five years. And I can easily see that happening with their Call of Duty franchise starting to pick back up. I think Call of Duty Modern Warfare was received a little bit better by the public and also their new Battle Royale game mode of Warzone was also received pretty well. And then the last thing about Activision Blizzard is the gaming community and the gaming leagues in esports. I do think that is a big industry for Activision and I do think they are positioned well to do good in that industry. So those are pretty much the four communication stocks that I like. We talked about Disney, AT&T, Verizon and Activision Blizzard. Hopefully the video was helpful and thanks for watching.